Death Wish. The Reunion. Garrett. I could never stand being around crowds, even more so after my unceremonious departure from my time enlisted. People have always tended to make me uncomfortable, especially when they are gathered together in a disorganized mass. Despite that uneasy feeling sending my anxiety over a cliff, I wanted to pay my respects to fallen comrades that I once held near and dear while overseas. That along with an open bar made attending the battalion reunion event tolerable. At the very least, I would run into a few familiar faces that were worth the trip all the way up to the middle of nowhere in upstate New York. Although I was dishonorably discharged, I was still allowed to attend the event as Foresters Plus One. Gotta love loopholes. It had been years since I had seen him, but we kept in contact nonetheless. We both knew the reasons why I got kicked out were complete dog shit, but I was happier as a free man outside of the military than nothing more than a warm body with little to no value while enlisted. It was a sentiment a lot of us vets had. Never carried a single regret joining, but thankful to no longer be a cog in a broken machine. The moment I arrived at the venue in Watertown, Forrester approached me with the same half-dance, half-strut swagger while clapping his hands to the beat of music he only imagined to hear that he was so well known for, the trademark of his nickname, Trinabad. I let out a genuine laugh with arms wide open to give my old friend a hug, something I only granted those I deemed his family. Welcome back to the frozen north, Wonderbread. His accent was just as heavy as I remembered. Not sure if I'm more surprised that they actually sent you an invitation, or that you willingly volunteered to come back to this shithole. Blink twice if you're here against your will. Forcer put his hands on his hips, opened his eyes wide. After a brief moment, he blinked several times before bursting out in laughter. Did you know they begged me to come? They sent emails, text messages, even letters in the mail. The only reason I responded was because I wanted to know how the hell they had any of my information. I had changed everything the moment I ETS'd, I swear it. Yeah, don't lose sleep over it. I'm sure they only want you here to look more diverse. Well, joke's on them. I said I would only come if I could bring whoever I wanted. At that point, my entire mood changed from reluctance to pure mischievous joy. So you chose the one guy that beat the shit out of the man they're honoring tonight. Damn, no fucking wonder why they call you Trinabad. After walking inside, signing the guest list, and receiving our name tags, we headed straight for the bar. I caught a few wandering, judgmental glances in my direction, but rather than be annoyed, I maintained a half cock smirk as a symbolic middle finger. We quickly ordered a couple shots of whiskey, giving cheers to our reunion. Just as we raised our glasses, I caught a scruffy face raising a glass to us at the end of the bar. My fucking god, is that who I think it is? I was shocked to see Mason attending the same event as us. There's no way they let both of us in here. Let me guess, our resident foreigner put you down as his wife or some shit? Frigia dotesh kakahol, Forrester exclaimed with a smile before downing his shot. Jesus, I couldn't understand you five years ago, and I certainly can't understand you now. How the hell have you managed to avoid deportation all these years? Yas as stupid as I members ya. The two shared a quick embrace between fits of insults. After they kicked you and Garrett out, the army assisted in getting my citizenship. So, brother, there's no way of getting rid of me now. About you? How the hell you managed to get in here? Uh, long story short, y'all remember how I was pork and honey bun while we were deployed? Well, never really stopped. Oh shit, congrats, man. I slapped Mason on the back while I motioned the bartender to pour some more shots. Never thought you were the marriage type. Mason's jaw dropped and he quickly shook his head. God damn it, no. When you see her, don't mention the M word. It's more of an extended friends with benefits, no strings attached thing. Ah, oh, hell. I gave him a nod of understanding. There's definitely a story there, but I don't think we want to know. It wasn't long after that for the rest of our old gang to gather around the bar playing catch up over drinks. I wasn't too keen on the setting we were in, but thankful to be around fond company. Du Yun continued her medical education and landed a sweet gig with the VA. Big Dave, unsurprisingly, took up work in private security as a bodyguard. Tech spent most of his days not doing much of anything out on his homestead collecting disability checks. And dear lovely Honey Bun put that geeky brain to work as robotics engineer designing drones for the Department of Defense. 
For the most part, everyone was comfortable where they were in life, with the exception of Mason. Without uttering a single word, I felt something was off with him. He had that long, disinterested stare that a lot of us shared. It was easy to tell there was something on his mind, but without asking him, I couldn't be sure. It was enough of a distraction for him to drink twice as much as the rest of us. We all had regrets. Bad memories associated with our time enlisted we wanted to drown into oblivion. Rather than make a scene in front of the others, I opted to keep an eye on him. After all the horrific things we had seen together, I had a pretty good idea of the demons he was running away from. Our laughs talking about the good old days really made time fly. Before long, it came time for the main event. The current 187 Battalion Commander took to the stage, thanking everyone, both currently enlisted personnel and the veterans invited that once served with the unit. A slideshow was presented on stage, giving the whole thing a high school reunion vibe that had us cracking up. From black and white photos taken decades ago, all the way up to when the seven of us were deployed to Kanduz, Afghanistan, I caught a single picture of Mason struggling to fill sandbags in 110 degree heat yet not a single one of myself. On one hand, I really didn't care since outside of the friendships I had made, I didn't have any fond memories of the battalion or the piss-poor leadership, let alone the fact that I was dishonorably discharged. On the other hand, it did feel as though I was eradicated from history. All the bloodshed and sweat I gave on behalf of my oath to serve my country was refused to be acknowledged. Mason's departure was a special circumstance. A general discharge under honorable conditions, all due to mental health issues. I kept checking in on him as the commander spoke to the guests. With each moment that passed, he became focused, holding a tight stare to each picture on the slideshow, as if he was waiting to see a particular picture. The joy he had while talking with us was replaced with a sour, stern expression, making him look disgusted with the whole presentation. I leaned in with a whisper to see if he wanted to leave, but all he did was shrug and continue to drink. I figured he was just dealing with combating mixed emotions like the rest of us. We all had our reasons to detest our time and service. Once the presentation transitioned to remembering the fallen, I noticed Mason cross his arms and bite his lip. It hit me just as hard as him to see three pictures flash on screen. Anderson, Harris, and Wade. The three people we had deep connections with that gave the ultimate sacrifice. Even now, just thinking of losing them makes me question if any of our efforts in the region was worth their lives. There wasn't enough time in the world for us to take in a moment of grief on their behalf. As quickly as they were shown on screen, their pictures were replaced by an officer the seven of us had a very rocky history with. Lieutenant Eric Bosch. I could have gone the rest of my life without ever hearing that name ever again. Yet instead of remembering the friends I had lost, I had to be reminded of arguably the worst human being I ever met. Needless to say, our last interaction was the reason for me getting kicked out of the army. They say not to speak ill of the dead, but that piece of shit deserved every ounce of the beating I gave him. The only regret I have was that it wasn't the ass-kicking I gave him that sent him to an early grave. Turns out one of the local nationals that worked on our fob murdered him long after I'd been sent home. I'll pour some out for that guy. He did the world a service. I wasn't surprised that the unit spent extra attention on his memorial. It was the five-year anniversary of his death, and the invitations made a heavy emphasis on remembering his sacrifice. They invited his family and his widowed wife and young daughter on the far side of the stage. When I looked over to check on Mason, he was gone. Fuck that guy, Mason yelled, pointing his finger to the screen as he drunkenly pushed his way toward the stage. LT Bosch deserved exactly what he got. There was a loud gasp at Mason's remarks, followed by a short silence as the commander motioned to have him removed from the venue. You're his kid? Mason looked at the frightened little girl hugging her mother's leg. Your father was a rapist. He was a monster. You're better off with him in the ground. All right, sir, enough. A couple members of military police approached him. You need to leave. Mason staggered a bit, scrunched up his face before laughing. The fuck are you gonna do? We're off post. You have no power here. 
As the MPs moved to restrain him, the rest of our group made our way between them. We'll take him with us, Big Dave said with a low yet intimidating voice as he looked down at the men. The seven of us began to move towards the door when we overheard the commander. There's a reason why we didn't invite the people that couldn't cut it within our ranks. You know what? I had enough of the nice quiet guy act. Fuck him. And fuck all the people that covered up what he did. A lot of us are glad he's dead. We didn't stay long enough to hear all the people yelling back at us appalled at our lack of respect. I did feel bad for the kid. She didn't deserve witnessing people talk bad about her father, although our feelings were true, especially in such a public display. Even still, it felt damn good to have one last metaphorical jab at the guy. Mason lurched towards the wood line and proceeded to vomit, heaving several times before finally leaning against a tree. I lit a couple cigarettes and gave him one. The seven of us stood in a circle with all eyes on Mason. No one wanted to be the first to say anything. It was hard because none of us could disparage what he did. We all hated Bosch. We all knew what he did. We were all glad he died the way he did. Things have been hard lately. Honeybun finally broke the silence. Her typically quick speech was slowed and calm. Mace has been seeking help for years, but all the therapy in the world can't erase certain memories. What Bosch did... She gave a guilty glance at Du Yun. Well, just the thought of it can eat a person until there's nothing left, Du Yun finished Honey's thought. I've had to live with it. What he did to me, how the unit covered it up, and how they silenced the guys that witnessed it. I've had to find my own way of dealing with all of it. But I still feel guilty for what happened to Mason and Garrett. It's taken a long time, but I have found a way to move on from what happened to me. But I lose sleep knowing I can't change what happened to you guys. Eh, fuck it. I flicked ash from the tip of my cigarette. I want it out anyway. Don't lose sleep over me. Getting out was one of the best things that ever happened to me. Me, me neither. Mason composed himself as he looked at Du Yun in the eyes. The bastard is dead. That's worth all the bullshit in the world for me. As she fought back tears of appreciation, Du Yun put a hand on Mason's shoulder. What happened to you? Ever since all that shit went down, you changed. I don't want to be responsible for that. Uh, let's see. How much time do we got? A few suicide attempts, constantly on a cocktail of antidepressants and mood stabilizers, the occasional night terror, oh, and of course, the endless streams of VA therapists that only give a fuck about a paycheck. Not that none of that is on you. I'm just done. So fucking done. Thank God I've got honey to help keep my shit together, but I'm tired. Sick and tired of being sick and tired is how the saying goes. Truth be told, I'm ready to die and tired of waiting. That had to be the most upfront and blunt self-assessment of one's mental state I have ever heard. To a degree, it rang true. There were so many moments when I felt the same way. An anger would build within me, and I would push people away as my own way of containing my rage. Some days were better than others, but I would feel empty knowing that some things were beyond my control to change. My anger with my own experiences would turn to a burning aggression to the world around me. In those moments, I wanted the entire world around me to collapse. If you could do anything in the world, what would it be? Big Dave was the next to break the silence. Uh, hell, I don't know. Mason shrugged. Fly and shoot lasers out of my eyes, I guess. No, I'm serious. Anything in the world. With us. What would it be? Anything at all, eh? Damn the consequences. You say you're ready to die? Fine, let's hear it. Do you unhit Dave's chest? What the fuck is wrong with you? You don't say shit like that to someone who's hanging by a thread. We all heard him. He doesn't care if he lives. Let the guy have at least the fantasy of a last wish. Tex spit chewing tobacco on the ground and agreed with Dave. Shit, he's right. Mason's a dead man walking. What is wrong with you two? Honey chimed in, protesting. Trinidad and I just looked at each other, smiled and agreed with Dave and Tex. Fuck it, if he's planning to off himself, we might as well have some fun on his way out. Duyun and Honey quickly began berating all of us. It was hard to pinpoint what they were yelling as they both screamed over one another. 
I'm guessing Do Yun was throwing out all her medical experience with suicidal patients while Honey Bun was focused on the emotional implications. I want to rob a bank. The rest of us fell silent when Mason made his request. You want to do what? Both of the girls were taken aback at the request. Mason uttered the sentence again with emphasis on each word. I want to rob a bank. As the girls remained dumbfounded, the rest of us jumped for joy, giving each other high fives while yelling, Hell yeah! It's true, I want to die. But if you want me to live so badly, then the price is we rob a bank together. Wait, a heist. That definitely sounds cooler. We do a bank heist robbery thing. Trinabad laughed. The way you say it sounds dumb as fuck, like Tex came up with it. Well, fuck you too, you island fucker. See? Exactly like Tex came up with it. We are not robbing a bank, Do Yun attempted to put an end to our foolish idea. Do you have any idea what you're asking of us? The level of risk involved for each and every one of us, let alone the amount of planning involved to pull something like that off. Fine. What about you then? Mason redirected the idea back at her. If you could do anything with us, and damn the consequences, what would it be? She froze for a moment, clearly pissed off at the very idea of thinking of doing something so idiotic. Fine. Damn the consequences? I'd take a bunch of rich people hostage and take all of their money. Do Yun's fantasy of playing Robin Hood made all of us break out into applause. That's a mighty bold request. Dave gave her a nudge. A lot riskier than a bank robbery. What about your little dream job with us? Better than that? Oh, hell yeah. I'd have us break into the Federal Reserve and get our hands on all that gold. Oh fuck, that's way cooler than robbing a bank. You're not helping Mason, I'm trying to show him how batshit crazy this whole thing is. Oh, you want crazy? Tex stretched his back and put his hands on his belt buckle. Well, we could break into Area 51, guns a blazing, so I can fuck me one of them aliens they got in there. That outlandish request finally broke the tension. This bizarre encounter with old friends made the trip all the way to upstate New York worth it. As crazy as it may have sounded, we all agreed that our lives had been a different kind of hell for each of us, and the idea of making a bucket list of strange, illegal adventures was an oddly healthy way for us to reconnect. There was a time when we were the only family we had, and meeting together after all those years proved the profound strength of our bond. Crazy as it may be, we all agreed to fulfill what Mason referred to as his death wish. Mason wanted to rob a bank. Du Yun wanted to steal from the rich. Big Dave wanted to break into the National Reserve. Honey Bun wanted to take back the home she grew up in. Trinidad wanted to cut the dick off a government official. Tex wanted to see aliens at Area 51. And I was perfectly content watching the world end alongside my friends. Collective and decidedly, we vowed to undertake a bucket list of the most outlandish deeds and damn any consequences.